This year has seen the meteoric rise of the young band Suede. Opening shot followed them from lead singer Brett Anderson's hometown Haywards Heath to a concert in Brighton and eventually to Los Angeles for a glimpse at their first American tour. Back home, a 15-year-old fan, Molly Walker, helped us find out why Suede have been hailed as one of the most exciting new bands. I love, I love the whole atmosphere. There's, everything's really good. And I think Matt said once, you feel with Suede like you're part of a community. You know, everyone's there. And then you feel, really, this is your place for the while. You know, this is brilliant. This is what teenage life is all about. Really. Suede is so important to me because what they say is just so me in a way. I just think, yes, that's how I've been feeling, you know, and someone has been through what I've been through. The station's probably the most interesting thing about AMT3. It's just the way out of the place, <laughs> I suppose, really. My best friend at school, we were both punks together, yeah, so we were in the punk gang. And then one day I was walking to school with him and he told me he decided to become a headbanger. <laughs> And, like, you know, my best friend, it was, we were the only two people that ended up punk in the school, and he decided he was going to be a, become a headbanger, and he sold, it, and sold me all his punk records and bought, bought a load of Deep Purple records and a denim jacket and some patchouli oil and, load of, and bought a load of studs for his denim jacket from the market and became this headbanger and completely kind of disowned anything to do with punk. I was into crass at the time. I used to have a red skiing jacket, so I didn't, I didn't dress like a member of Crass. I had a red skiing jacket which I sewed a Nagasaki nightmare patch onto, which is the name of a Crass song. Um, um, I don't know really what I looked like, I probably looked like a twit. Sort of remnant from the late 1970s with a, with a home done haircut, which most people wear at that time. I perceive them as being very important um, in the music business, to, you know, a very important part of the music business today. Um, because there was such a vast gap in, in indie music particularly, and I think Suede came along at the right time. I saw Suede first at the beginning of 1992, and I thought they were exceptional. They weren't headlining or anything. They were just on a bill with other bands. And they stood out, you know, like, like the proverbial sort of thing. When I decided um, to put Suede on the cover of Melody Maker and called them the best new band in Britain, I felt very strongly that they would be able to carry it off. I would not have taken that risk because it could have destroyed a group to do that to them because all of a sudden you make them victims. Everybody's out after them trying to disprove what you've said. I felt very strongly that they were the best new band in Britain. I still think that they are. The reason Suede became so successful so rapidly was because the critics loved them, because they were no different, exactly the same as everything the critics grew up with. They hark back to an era of rock and roll that the critics understand kind of 1973 down the front of the Hammersmith Odeon watching David Bowie perform all his latest hits and the critics went with that because everybody wants to hear the music they first grew up with so they forced it upon the rest of us. I don't agree when critics say that they're just you know, 70s carbon copies or whatever, because I think if they were, people would see through that and just think their music's too 70s orientated, we're not interested, but I don't think people say that, because for us, the teenagers who are Suede's target audience, we haven't lived through the 70s as teenagers, so we don't know what the music's like. I met Brett, he was, was at a party somewhere in, in Hayward's Heath. And the next time I saw him was when we were both at the same college. And he was, uh, he was playing Beatles songs for some reason. 
on an electric guitar in the in one of the rooms. And and the f I think the first thing that I actually said to him was, um, "Do you want to be in a band?" Because I was in an, an incredibly dodgy sub goth band at the time. <laughs> Brett just started messing around in his bedroom playing terrible kind of sub folk acoustic rock. The moment that, that Bernard turned up is the, is the moment Suede started to, to be anything. Basically, because he, he just made me and Brett buck up our ideas completely. I mean, one of the first things he said to us was, at, at, at the end of the very first time we met him, was he asked how old we were. And we were both 22, I think. So we both said, oh, 22. And he just said, oh, you better get a move on then. Um, which was <laughs> this is incredibly cheeky from him, because it's the first time we've ever met him. But it's completely true. Because we had up until that point been quite happy to mess around thinking up good names or thinking what would be on the sleeve or something. I watched the skyline for him to come. And when he comes along, we'll be gone. And we'll go. We'll be there in the headline, there overnight. The time when I met Brett, it was just, um, I just thought he, he had a great voice and he was nice and he looked good and all that. And, and, and the, main, the main point was that I knew that I always, I never wanted to be an acoustic guitar player strumming at the back and sort of being happy like that. I always, I always wrote songs from the moment I learned how to from the moment I learned how to put two chords together, that's the first time I wrote a song. And so I'd always wanted to be a songwriter. This is the big time. This is the way. Now he's in the big time. And you're in the way. And the final piece in the jigsaw appeared when we met Simon, who's a friend of a friend, who used to sell tickets down at Ewley, where we'd go and see gigs. And we'd tried loads of drummers before, because we wanted a, a real drummer, um, but no one had fitted in at all. And again, with Simon, it was exactly the same as with Bernard. Within, like, 15 seconds of him playing, we, we all just knew he was completely right. <laughs> It's always been my ambition to be a musician, pop star, whatever, you know, always, since I was four. I can't live out with me. This is my 13th band, but uh, all the bands I've been in before, uh, they just weren't. This is the first band I've ever played with that, that I've felt completely 100% into. I sometimes think, oh, it's so mundane and boring and average living in Devon. I can't wait to get away and do something a bit more positive, a bit different with my life, which is what Suede have introduced to me. They're not um, famous in an American film star way. You know, they've made it for themselves through their music. I don't think, you know, they were brought into a glamorous world, but they're definitely... I think it was so unglamorous for them that they've made the glamour.
persuade have affected Molly's life quite positively. You know, it's, it's, she's taken on quite a lot of their statements and it's, it's perfect because they open up so many topics of conversation for us. Somehow we've actually got closer, Molly and myself, through this, you know, and it's, it's not just a crazy obsession with um, a band, it's, it's, they're more than that somehow, they're, they're saying something about society today. Would you like have gone to Mayday or come up here? Hello. 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 You're right. Hi, Alice. We've got the oh, brownies down. How are you? Got dirty hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, Molly had to sing, um, was it The Next Life in R.E. to a whole R.E. group. She did it, they didn't it. Yeah, in front of the whole class. And I, 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 I sang oh, on piano. Oh, was for R.E.? Mm. Yeah. She's got, she got her homework, so Mr. Roberts, our teacher, said you have to sing a suede song. <laughs> <laughs> Not like Chase The Next Life. When you but, sang it in front of the class? Yeah. Well, I was only yeah. seven. <laughs> Did you have to do? Did you do it all? That when with a full set of it? Yeah, I had to do everything. Although I stopped on the high bit. Mr. Robert sounds like. And I really feel quite inspired to write. Quite a lot of sadness. Quite a lot, a lot of feeling of, of dislocation, and at the same time, uh, um, uh, the, the opposite end of the scale quite inspires me. Um, kind of like a really kind of um, sort of searing, um, almost. Violent side to life really, really inspires me. I like you. You're white, tasty geezer. You're my mate. A mate, somebody. We're one of the lads. Whenever I write, write about people in dislocated situations, whether they're isolated, sort of you know, in, the, in, in, the, in where they live or what they look like or how they think. I always want it to be quite inspiring to the people that it's aimed at. And people always think of the traditional sort of view of, of heroic people is of either, is of kind of like sort of someone in the ghetto or something like that. And of course they're heroic as well, but people never really talk about uh, some sort of housewife in North London, you know. And I decided to write a song about it, so I wrote Sleeping Pills about it. Which is just about, I don't know, the sort of drama of the everyday, I suppose. Someone else. But I often write as, as, just a, as just a human being, as just a spirit. And so I have the ability to be able to, to, be able to flit into, into other minds. And often when I talk about, I talk about men in my songs, people assume that it's because because it's got something to do with homosexuality and it hasn't at all. It's much more to do with the spiritual perception of what being in, in these situations is all about, really. I had this ambition to that, that you know one day it would be wonderful if you know you know you can make kind of credible kind of great music you know basically a kind of guitar rock you know traditional guitar rock music but that people could um, understand on all levels <laughs>
our ambition would probably be to, be to spend all of our time in a studio. I really envy bands like R.E.M. and stuff that can, uh, that, that, that can afford to do that, that can just spend all their time in studios and not and play live if they want to, but it doesn't really particularly matter. One time that we're at our most relaxed in a way is when we're just working on new material because you just slot back into just being in the band and you don't have to worry about any of the nonsense um, and it all comes ridiculously naturally. Bernard sort of comes up with you know, tunes, sometimes, sometimes they're completely fully formed, sometimes they're completely uh, got structure and got middle eights and something, sometimes they're just riffs. And really, I, I, I just work on what, what kind of gives me that spark of inspiration, really. Words never come, to, come into it at all with me. All I know is I've got music going around in my head 24 hours a day. It's the last thing. It puts me to sleep, so I wake up with it. When I'm not talking, I'm thinking about it. And, um, which is pretty sad, <laughs> in a way, because it makes me very dull. Committed, and you, you have to you have to not see any point in any other life. Otherwise, you're not giving everything. None of us can act, or none of us can paint, or anything like that. You know, I'm rubbish at everything else. Can't even change a plug. Suede is here. I love you. Bye.